My problem is that secular Israelis defined Judaism as orthodox so that they could reject it. Most of this country didn't turn to them to say, hey, why didn't you fight bravely until your last drop of blood? Most of this country said, thank God you're alive because we have lost so much. First, get out of Ephrat, then get out of Jerusalem, then get out of Tel Aviv. There is a way to get to a peace uh, agreement and to a real peace between the sides. Stop hiding our interest. Like, this is my Jewish interest. This is my Palestinian national interest. We have a common interest that no one talked about. If you come to me and say there's going to be a two-state solution and Jerusalem's going to belong to the Jewish people, I'm going to say, what are you smoking? In 50 years, there's no doubt in my mind, there will be a bat mitzvah at the wall. Israel will be leading the Jewish world in innovation in Jewish. We have to do it, otherwise we will perish. The most important thing at the end of the day is that you know one simple thing. I love Israel. I love Israel. I love this country. I'm Mark Golub in Jerusalem at the Hebrew Union College Jewish Institute of Religion in Jerusalem. There's a saying, Acharon, Acharon, Chaviv, Chaviva, uh, which means the last one is always the most beloved, and you are our most beloved. <laughs> I have an extraordinary <laughs> pleasure of meeting someone I've wanted to sit with for years, Anat Hoffman, who is the executive director of the Reform Movement's Religious Action Center here in Jerusalem, and she's also the head of an extraordinary organization called Women of the Wall, which is trying to, in some way, achieve greater freedom for non-Orthodox women at the Western Wall. And I have a chance to speak with her and uh, in front of the lovely 20 or so people who have joined me for this Shalom TV tour of Jerusalem. May I ask you to give Anat a warm welcome. <laughs> uh, first of all, before I ask you any substantive question, I just want you to give me a thumbnail, um, sort of background, how you become Anat Hoffman. Where were you born? Uh, how are you here in Israel? A little bit about you personally. Uh, well, I was born here in Jerusalem. Yeah. My mother is the first daughter of Kibbutz Ramat Rachel, which is walking distance from this building. And um, I was a terrible student in school. No. Yes. Uh, I was very busy swimming. I was Israel's swimming champion in Ooh. almost everything you want. <laughs> and um, I couldn't get to any Israeli college because I didn't have a matriculation, Bagud. I should actually wipe the smile off my face when I say I was, I was really the worst student. But uh, I was very lucky that UCLA in the United States couldn't care less about my grades, but wanted my times in the 100 and 200 freestyle and the 200, 400 medley. And uh, I have an American education. I had four years at UCLA mm -hmm. where I learned to obliterate my Israeli accent. I could have chosen a Southern drawl or a Bostonian accent. I chose California. And if you, if you really want to have a testimony that it is all made up, just give me a glass of beer and <laughs> out goes the accent and comes back the Israeli accent. That, so can, that helps so, give us a place. Mm -hmm. And how do you end up here at the Religious Action Center? So uh, I thought I would be a psychologist. I thought I had touchy-feely tendencies. Boy, was I wrong about my <laughs> own personality. I have no knack for it whatsoever. But I have a natural, <laughs> a, a, while I was trying to be a psychologist, I got a big phone bill from, our, from Bezik, who was then the only telephone company in Israel. And the phone bill was very, very high. I just came back from the United States, and I've seen with my own eyes that ITT made money and gave itemized bills. But Bezik wouldn't give itemization. They said, and I'm quoting, we've had five wars, the Holocaust too. We can't give itemization. <laughs> As, what's the connection? I don't know. Anyway, so I formed the uh, Bezik Afflicted Clients Association. We were 5,000 people. Half of us were Anglo. Why? Why, by the way, why do you think half of the afflicted clients were Amer American, Canadians, UK, Australian? Why? Because they knew about it. 
because they've seen an itemized bill. <laughs> That's it. They've seen the miracle. They know it exists, and it's possible to make money and itemize. Anyway, we uh, started having national conferences, one of them in this building, of people test with testimonies against Bezek. And uh, the head of Bezek, Tzvi Amid, never showed up, so we had empty chair conferences. We also had a phone hurling competition of how far I brought my athlete friends, how far they can throw the phone. Someone who I will never mention who climbed up the main building of Bezek in the entrance of Jerusalem. Instead of Bezek, they changed one letter to Nezek. Nezek means damage. Boy, it's windy up there. Anyway, Nezek. <laughs> And um, also, we went to the small claims court, and we won 43 out of 46 cases against Bezik. Every judge had a phone. Uh, every journalist had a phone. We got a lot of media exposure. And nine months after we started, the d director general of Bezik, Tzvi Amid, resigned. And uh, the new guy, Tzchakaul, made me head of the High Court of Appeals of Bezik. All my 5,000 uh, afflicted clients were excused of their bills within 60 seconds. That didn't take much thinking. Bezik still made money, and a year and a half after that, all Israelis received their first itemized bill, and I never became a psychologist. Round of applause. That is a Bazel code. I discovered I have an uncanny ability to get awfully mad and get a lot of other people awfully upset, and when I and change something. So then I was elected to the City Council of Jerusalem. I was there for 15 years. Always in the opposition, always the opposite uh, Mayor Kolek, then Mayor Olmelt. I had over 30 Supreme Court petitions against the mayor and four police investigations. One of them is still pending. And um, I'm a professional troublemaker, I think. <laughs> um, and one more question about how you become you. How much of what you are is a product of your mother and father? It's not a product of my parents as much as my big brother. I am the sister of Ron Hagaon. Ron Hagaon in Hebrew means Ron the genius. I am the dumb sister of my brilliant, brilliant brother. So he had a bar mitzvah and he had everything and he, and I was always told, why are you failing such in school? Why? You are Ronnie's sister? Sit with Ronnie. He'll explain this to you in a minute. The only thing Ron can't do is swim. <laughs> yes. By and the way, as adults, are you close to him now? Very, very. In Where fact, is he? my last birthday, he wrote, I won't tell you how many times, you were right and I was wrong. It's Bart Simpson writing on the blackboard. You were right and I was wrong. You were right. And you know what? It didn't give me naches. I'm over it. <laughs> That's a lovely, lovely story. Thank you for sharing that with us. Uh, Aren't we all the dumb sister of some? Oh, yeah. really <laughs> <laughs> but in my case, he really is. Brilliant. Oof. What's he doing in life? He was just fi fired from, <laughs> <laughs> from IBM after 19 years of service at age 62. Um, and decided that he's going to teach kids in, in school, primary school. Uh, primary school, teach them math. And he is with a PhD in computers, teaching math to fifth graders, and he's a huge hit. So. You told us before we sat the salary, down. Salary, though. Yes, I know. Yeah. You told us before we sat down. You're a little concerned, as we're taping right now, about the fact that you haven't heard from your 15-year-old son how many children do you have? Three. Three, and the ages are? 27, 24, and 15. And where are they in life? I want you to know, I've been, never, I've been in this room almost every day, every, every day of the week. There are always groups, I'm always speaking. None of these questions were ever asked. <laughs> I'm completely unprepared. Is this good or bad? It's what, it's refreshing. It's new. I'm used to, you know, this is the legal and political arm of the reform movement. Look at this. <laughs> we'll get uh, there, too. But is it interesting? It's fascinating. Yes. Yes. So how come it's never being guessed? Most people don't care about the person. I care about the person. Ah. It's true. I think the nicest thing in Israel are Israelis. Yes. Also the biggest turnoff. <laughs> <laughs> but, but uh, yes. Okay, so uh, the 27-year-old is now doing his um, 
his BA in Applied Mathematics after yes. finishing one BA already in composition. Why did we pay for a full BA in music when <laughs> the turns around and does another one in math? It, well, it turns out music is not going to make any money. Does it take four years to figure that out? <laughs> <laughs> and now he's doing applied mathematics. He really takes after my big brother. They get along together. In fact, my big brother teaches at that college. And it's wonderful to have Rona going right in my house. <laughs> Very good. <laughs> um, my daughter is studying film. She's now doing a film about intimacy where she's showing how our pet snake is swallowing a rat. <laughs> she feels that the moment that the, the rat is in his mouth is a moment of intense intimacy. Where did I go wrong? <laughs> oh, what not? And, and my, your 15 year old is... My 15 year old is obsessed with Mars bars and he wants to buy them in Canada and he's not calling. Here is television. Call home! <laughs> Please, Yoel, call home. We're dying to know we're all, you're okay. But wait, you know, there is something profound about this, that a mommy is a mommy is a mommy. Yeah. That's really, really nice. And we could just finish the picture. Your husband? Uh, I'm divorced. So we were Happily divorced with a very nice guy. Lovely. Yes, well, yes. Very nice. After 33 years. And uh, this is an important comment about Israel altogether. Love is what remains after you know the truth. Uh, and uh, yes. Say it again. So we had say it again. Love is what remains after we know the truth. We were very loving for 33 years, and uh, and now we're very happily divorced. But this is very true for Israel. And if you are looking at the truths of Israel, and you are ridding yourselves of the puppy love, and you see uh, the complexities, the difficulties, the heroes, uh, such as Danny Zeidman that I heard you met. Uh, and some of our really rotten, uh, rotten Israelis, such as Dov Lio, who's uh, the rabbi that was recently arrested, that his uh, followers are saying the rabbis are above the law. No. Yes. Or the guy who's sitting in jail for shooting and, and murdering our prime minister, mm. Igal Amir. I would like to remind you, 33 women wanted to marry the man. One of them actually did. There is a movement in Israel, who Igal Otanu, he will redeem us using his name, Igal, to, and there's always a member of Knesset wishing to release him. So there are some terribly ugly Israelis. I believe in a two-state solution, all the fanatics in one. <laughs> Arabs and Jews. And put up a big, put up a big That's right. <laughs> but it is so profound what you've just said. And so real. It's probably somebody else's idea. I don't care. You said it. <laughs> and you say it well. Um, I want you to expand on it. And especially from your own perspective, how long did it take you personally to come to the realization that love is, is what remains after? You know the truth. Okay. How long did it take you to know the truth? And, I want to, and, and I'm asking this seriously now. When you first began to feel the truth, did it hurt the love? That's, a, that's too complex. I can just say that I've been talking about Israel's warts. I'm a wart doctor, and I specialize on the warts on Israel's butt. And I'm trying to talk to you guys about things that really are major turnoffs in Israel, such as the fact that you, Mark, are not a rabbi in this country. And he's not a rabbi because he's a graduate of the Hebrew Union College, which is right here. The Pope recognizes the HUC. Every academic institution recognizes the Hebrew Union College. But the state of Israel doesn't? Now that's chutzpah. Mm -hmm. That's big chutzpah. Why does that continue? First, Israelis don't care and don't know about it. They, they don't even understand that they're missing that product. That's why it's important to remember the Bezik bill. They don't know there's another kind of rabbi. The only rabbi they know is the one they don't want to have any contact with. So we need reform rabbis more than the reform rabbis need us. I know that you, when you came to Israel, you thought you would, you're visiting what, the Club Med of the Jewish Soul, and here is the big supermarket of Jewish experiences. You come from where there are supermarkets of Jewish experiences. This place is bankrupt, Jewishly, in many, many ways. So uh, the fact that the Hebrew Union College is not recognized is 
is a big wart. And it continues because Israelis don't care and because you don't use your nuisance value. And you, having television, you have a huge nuisance value. You should really report about some of these outrageous things that are happening in Israel, especially on the issue of religion and state, and get reform and conservative and liberal <coughs> Jews all over the North America riled up. And if I upset you so far, I can upset you even more. If you get to my e-newsletter, if you sign up, every, and I will write you every week more upsetting things mm -hmm. about Israel's particular warts. And put in your address too, because then I can send you a Shana Tova on Rosh Hashanah. <laughs> um, <clears throat> so uh, the big, uh, to your question, I think 10 years ago, a, uh, a grandmother of a 16-year-old turned to me at the end of a, a presentation, and she said, you know, I used Social Security savings to bring this boy to Israel. So he would love Israel. Now he hates Israel and he loves you. So where does that bring me? And that's profound. And I think that's what Mark has brought you, to meet Israelis mm -hmm. that you can fall in love with. That's a wonderful idea. But uh, I realized from this grandmother that I, I'm over the top. And I adopted a, a formula called Honesty Helps. And helps stand for H, hope. I should always give you hope. And I did. I showed you how, for example, the basic uh, afflicted clients were able to change something major in Israel. And I can give you a list of many other things. For example, all conversions in the world are recognized in Israel for purposes of Aliyah. That's a victory that we have. Mm -hmm. All conversions are recognized. Everybody you know who converted in, the, in America or anywhere else by a reform conservative rabbi can make Aliyah to Israel and is recognized as a Jew. That took us 18 years in the Supreme Court, but we won it. Hope. E is for empathy. I'm very low on that. I should work on showing how, that I am empathetic to the fears of Israelis, to the frustrations of Israelis. I have no patience for that, but I should work on that. L is for listening. Uh, I should listen to my audience. Uh, and I always ask questions, of because uh, I've heard me before. I ask you for questions. I get marvelous questions from Jews who visited Israel. <clears throat> you know that 75% of Reformed Jews have not visited Israel. Mm -hmm. P is for problem solving. Very strong on that. The Israel Religious Action Center is in the um, court 60 times a year. That's more than once a week. Don't call us. We'll sue you. <laughs> We're big on suing. And we are winning every week. I, great things for Israelis. For example, we just stopped the segregation on buses. Um, that what, what do you mean segregation There were buses? segregations between men and women in mm -hmm. 2,500 rides every day in Israel. Women were asked to board the bus from the back door and sit in the back of the bus. This throughout Israel or only in certain cities? Um, it's throughout Israel, but in, in Tzfat, Arad, Bnei Brak, um, in Jerusalem, Beit Shemesh. Arad is an Orthodox-oriented no, city? No. Tzfat? Okay, Tzfat maybe. Tzfat, yes. Okay, but More Ashdod? So. Some of them, mm -hmm. Bet Shemesh? I don't know. Anyway, 2,500 such rides. We went to court. A committee was formed. The committee is a big deal. It took a year. The committee completely sided without, with us, even though they heard 1,500 testimonies that, you won't believe that. Modesty increases safety. If women and men travel separately, safety of the bus is higher. 1,500 witnesses. Listen, you've got your evangelists, and I've heard testimonies of heal the sick and raise the dead. I was very entertaining. OK, you've got your own. Anyway, so um, we won a case. And if you board any Israeli bus this morning, any one of them, have you boarded a bus recently? It has a sign in all buses, and it says, due to Supreme Court Petition 47607, mm. a passenger can sit anywhere they wish. Anyone harassing a passenger for where they sit is guilty of a felony, etc. Mm -hmm. So now we are having freedom rides to have, make sure that this is implemented. The number of uh, segregated rides has gone down from 2,500 a day to 600 a day. But still, we are having, and if we had time with you, we'd bring you to one of these bus rides. We're having one on uh, Sunday and one on Tuesday with tours from abroad. Bring you on the buses, sit in the front, and make room for women. And so we are problem solving. 
And the last, the S, is for self-criticism. I'm too big on that. Uh, but that's my job. I want to have Israel live up to what we had in mind. And we had a big dream in mind, much bigger than just not to have another Holocaust. We had a dream of putting to work Jewish values. Isn't that exciting? Mm -hmm. So you should all envy me, all envy me, because I get paid full time to be engaged in the most interesting dialogue of Jewish history. What are the values of the Jewish state? Isn't that wonderful? Mm -hmm. And I believe in tolerance and equality and pluralism. And there are some people who believe that the Jewish state should adopt other values. We should be fighting them. That's why I want you to write your sign up. That's a long answer. No, a beautiful answer. Yeah. May I push you a little bit? <laughs> you know, sometimes Americans say to me, I don't want to hurt your feelings. <laughs> <laughs> Guys, you should see five minutes of the Municipality Jerusalem Council and you will understand you don't have in your repertoire <laughs> anything that comes close to pushing or hurting feelings. I did a study on a derogatory names used by this mayor to silence opposition. I ha it's a 200 page study. Where, where are you in this? Okay. Uh, and the reason I say this is you understand emotionally and intellectually, I love everything you say. And I'm trying to imagine Therefore, how can I express to you what somebody watching us might wish they could say to you if they were sitting with you? There are those in the state of Israel who also feel that the Orthodox community not only has a right to live a style that makes them comfortable, that that is one of the great opportunities of having a Jewish state. And I'm thinking to myself, would an Orthodox Jew say to you, there's no reason why women should have to sit in the back of the bus, but could there be a section of the bus, maybe in the back, where Orthodox Jews who don't, Orthodox males, who are uncomfortable, not because they have any necessarily malevolent feelings for women, but they feel that there should be a separation for all kinds of reasons, some of which are very valid, especially from their perspective. Should there be a place on a bus where an Orthodox Jew, Orthodox male, can get on the bus and sit with other males and not feel that in some way they are, they are put in a compromised position from their own perspective? Again, it doesn't have to be in the front of the bus. But would you argue that the Orthodox community also has a right to find a way of accommodating their own needs without, in some way, discriminating against others, but that they too have a right to be comfortable in Israel. That's the multiculturalism uh, argument, and you said it very eloquently. Uh, in a word, uh, our petition was not to abolish the segregated buses. Mm -hmm. the, the impetus, is that impetus? English? impetus of our petition was that we wish to have a a bus at the same uh, frequency and at the same price that will be not segregated next to the segregated bus. Mm -hmm. Of course, economically it makes absolutely <laughs> no sense, but that's what we demanded and this is how we won the case. It was a brilliant move. Now I can tell you what the Supreme Court answers your question. In a word, no. In a, even in a multicultural society, as long as it is a state-run bus, the state cannot do segregation, cannot segregate. If people in Muncie, New York, wish to have a bus that is segregated, let them pay for a private company. It won't cost six shekel 40 a ticket. No, no, no. It will cost something like 30 shekel a ticket because the bus company is heavily subsidized by who? By me. I subsidize it and I refuse to subsidize segregation. And that's why the post office that we found that is segregated, the police station that we found that is segregated, the sidewalks that we found that are segregated, the city benches that are segregated, and the numerous HMOs in Israel that are segregated, all these are public property, government services, and it's illegal to segregate. The fact that we won the buses also stopped El Al from segregating. El Al was about to have segregated flights, and the light rail in Jerusalem was about to have segregated cars. This is all illegal. I'm just saying that when I went to court, I went with a multiculturalism mm -hmm. a, a, a argument. argument, but the court went even further than our petition and said it's illegal.
Just as a side note, the segregated buses are about 30% cheaper than the regular buses. For example, the bus from Haifa to Jerusalem is 29 shekel in the segregated bus and 44 shekel in the regular bus. So my son, who's a student, yes, he and his girlfriend, they always board the segregated bus. He doesn't care sitting with the women in the back, and they save money all year round. This is, um, yeah, so we have the Freedom Rides, and the Freedom Riders are stopping segregation. Altogether, segregation started from the bus going to and from the wall. And that's a great segue to no, talk about yet. the wall is segregated. No, we'll get to it. We'll get to it. We'll get to it. It's, it's interesting that, I mean, segregation, a, uh, it's interesting that segregation from an Israeli perspective is not racial, but is gender based. Can you think of a, another word? For when you divide people according to some. No, it's just interesting that if you said to an American, we want to desegregate a bus, we think of black and white. We don't think of male and female. It's a different model in Israel. I want to put an asterisk here. They're all here. variations on the same theme. It's mm -hmm. racism. I, I understand. I want to put an asterisk, but it's not racism. That's not fair. No? Okay. No, no. It's not racist for an Orthodox Jew to say, I don't want to sit next to a woman. It, but it's problematic, and I understand the argument that in a, in, a, in a secular state, and Israel is a Jewish state in the Shema and a secular state in concept, that there should not be the imposition, and, and we will come next to the wall, there should not be an imposition of a certain kind of Jewish practice, which Israel has fallen into for political reasons. I'm, I very much want you to talk about that, but I want to do an asterisk first. I love you, Mark, but uh, we have a uh, this uh, disagreement. Go ahead. Our neshama is not the Jewish part. Our neshama is practical in this country. It's not our, the Jews. Judaism should be a platform. It's not just that we will have Yiddishkeit and we will say, have have a Nagila when when the president comes up on the a bima. That's not it. The idea is that Judaism will dictate to mm -hmm. us life choices and how we deal with our population and the importance of the minority. Thirty six times in the Bible it says, "Do right by a minority." This should be our policy, and this is not an neshama. This is law. This should be law. Okay. So I'm challenging yeah, that. I, I, Maybe and the we'll, second thing, we'll have you that. heard from an Orthodox Jew why he's not willing to sit next to a woman? I did. What did he tell you? She's got the cooties. No. What? No. She's got no, the cooties. Nobody. She's no. unclean. Who are you talking to? I'm talking you, to... You're talking to the worst of the Orthodox. 15 years you're in city council. I sat next to seven deputy the, mayors. But look, you know, there are some Reform Jews who would give you also the willies, I promise you. And there are Orthodox Jews who give give us the willies. The trick is not to the trick is not to compare the best of one with the worst of the other. That's true. I want to compare right. the That's best true. of both. Okay. I want to asterisk. Okay. And ask you a question. This is a footnote. You have mentioned a number of times in passing your contact with and work with the Supreme Court of the State of Israel. Does does the institution of the Supreme Court, in any sense, give you hope and a sense of pride that for all the problems, and I probably am talking to the person who could describe them best in, in who all the people I'm going to speak with, but does the Supreme Court as a institution and as a process give you hope and pride, or are you also upset with the Supreme Court? Well, of course I'm upset with the Supreme Court because they don't always rule my way. <laughs> but uh, I, uh, and, and they have two problematic practices that bother me. One is foot dragging. I mean, we have, we hold regularly birthdays to files that are over five years or 10 years. We bring a birthday cake, we bring it to the wall, to the steps of the Supreme Court. We light candles, we bring media, and we say five years for this case, 10 years for this case. And usually that gets uh, the verdict happening. So foot dragging is a tactic. It's actually a political tool by the court, and that's a problem. And the second thing is that they really fear issues of religion and state because they, if it's a really tiny minority, such as the Reform Conservative Women of the Wall, etc., they will not go on a limb. Mm -hmm. And uh, the story of the Women of the Wall is that uh, they offered us, after 14 years in the court, a solution, classical, go to another wall. 
Why that wall? There are other walls in Jerusalem where you cause less trouble. Here's a nice wall right here in Bet Shimshon. Come pray here. Nobody will be bothered. So we were offered an alternate wall. The Supreme Court ordered the state to spend almost five million shekel to make that other wall nice and sweet. Just like the other one. Here is the holy Geiger counter. It's holy. You go there. So separate but equal does not work, and they use that. So uh, these are the problems I have, but a sense of hope. First, let's talk about hope. Americans think of hopes as a cable, as something big that you can hold on to and, and you know, drag a, uh, a <coughs> huge car with. Hope comes from the, mila, the word hope in Hebrew, tikva. comes from the word kav. Kav is a string, a thread, a very flimsy little thing. So do I have hope from the court? Of course, but my expectations of hope are very flimsy. They're a tiny little thing. Yes, so uh, we would not, Danny Zeidman and myself could never have gotten to where we are without a strong and, and, and brave Supreme Court peti uh, petition. So the problem is implementation. The court orders the state to do something. For example, to put me in the religious council of Jerusalem as a reformed Jew. The council doesn't convene. The mayor says, may my right arm be cut off before I invite her to come to any meeting of the religious council. I made a Did mistake. he say that literally? Yes. I made a, we're talking about Uli Lopoliansky, the Orthodox mayor, between a, the current mayor and Olmert. And uh, I made a mistake. I sued him for contempt. I won 30,000 shekel. He couldn't give it from the city coffers. He had to personally pay 30,000 shekel for mis- uh, not, uh, not implementing the court's decision. He turned to the public and he said, this is shekel hakodesh, this is a holy shekel. Give me money to pay, to pay this, this money that I owe, the fine. And uh, he, the, the, I saw a little lorry with many bags of single shekels that he got from 30,000 individuals in Jerusalem. That's what got him reelected. Every person gave the mayor a shekel so he could pay the fine against this bad reform that wants to sit and it, it did him a lot of good. Uh -huh. I shouldn't have sued for contempt. Okay, but in the meantime, there is, something that makes, there is something that makes you proud about the Supreme Court system. Huge, yeah. Okay. So it's independent of the other two arms of government and it orders them what to do and that's wonderful. And sometimes they don't do it or drag their feet as well. Look, for example, we're trying to get a salary for a reform rabbi. The reform rabbi is called Miri Gold. It's a great name because it's the gold precedent. So now the Supreme Court is telling the state, we will rule against you if you don't find some solution to give Miri Gold a salary. And the state is offering the following. We will give the money to this rabbi, but not as a check to Rabbi Miri Gold. We could never write a, a check for a woman called Miri, Rabbi Miri Gold. What we will do, the sports department in the Ministry of Culture will be moving to the kibbutz where she works, a sum, which is comparable to a salary, for informal Jewish education. I don't want to accept it. Don't you? You don't want to accept it. I want a salary for her, like to the other 4,000 state-paid rabbis, all Orthodox men. But the court would not like it if I come and say, take your money and shove it. They will say, you want money for a rabbi? You're getting money for a rabbi. You don't like the sports department? Tough. You're going to get it this way. This is how we do things in Israel. You understand? I'm going to be pushed into this. Mm -hmm. uh, mm -hmm. And Miri Gold will get a salary. But not in the right way. Not in the right way. OK, end of the footnote. If the Israeli court system sided with you and insisted on desegregating buses, meaning that they, nobody who was Orthodox could dictate where a woman would sit. Yes. Talk to me now about the wall issue. Why have you not had similar success petitioning the courts of Israel to say that perhaps the most well-known spot in the Jewish world and in many ways, the spot that has become emblematic to world Jewry and the world for Israel, namely the Western Wall in Jerusalem. 
where human beings from all over the world, yes, there is a very strong Orthodox presence at the wall, but anytime you go to the wall, there are people from all over the world, Orthodox, non-Orthodox, Jewish and not Jewish, who come to that spot, who feel in some way it represents something not only about the Jewish world, but something about the divine. Whether they're right or wrong, that isn't, isn't an issue. That's what people feel. Why wouldn't that spot be a national spot and not an Orthodox shul? How have you lost? And, and you should take a moment to make sure everybody understands what the real issues are mm -hmm. and then describe the battle and why women of the wall are still fighting an uphill fight. So the women of the wall are fighting to have three things. Pray out loud, that is to say Shema Israel, out loud, not quietly, not with her lips moving and voice not heard. The second thing is to wear this talit, which is the women of the wall talit. Here it is, it's lovely. And the way we paid our lawyer a quarter of a million dollars throughout these years is by talitot. It's sold beautiful. all over the world. Beautiful. This is Sarah, Rivka, Rachel, and Leah, you see, the four mothers. With all due respect to the three fathers, four mothers make a perfect talit. <laughs> so, um, so we want to wear our talitot, we want to pray out loud and say Shema Yisrael, and we want to read Torah. And for the last 22 years, we've been, yes, in an uphill battle, and one would say, you know, the Dalai Lama was asked, do you think you did right moving out of Tibet? And he says, well, we'll know in 4,000 years. <laughs> so at this point, we have done worse for women than it was 22 years ago. Because now there is a regulation called the Women of the Wall Regulation. It's one of the 13 regulations of the wall. One cannot piss on the wall. One should not uh, spit on the wall. No graffiti on the wall. No begging at the wall. No. <laughs> and then, yeah. And the 13th regulation is one cannot perform a religious act that offends the feelings of others. Anyone performing such an act is guilty of, is punished by one year imprisonment. This is the women of the wall re a, a regulation. Now, Mark, if someone throws a chair at me, does that hurt my feelings? Of course. And is that a breaking of the 13th Absolutely. regulation? No. He's a rabbi. He's a rabbi. Is there a lawyer here? Yes, yeah, right to your One right. cannot perform a religious act that offends the feelings of others. Throwing a chair is plain assault. A religious act that offends others is only the women of the wall. It reminds me that once we passed a regulation in the municipality called any mayor who served 28 years in the municipality of Jerusalem and whose name is Teddy Kalik will have a driver for life. <laughs> so that's the Teddy Kalik regulation. And this is the women of the wall regulation. It does not apply to anybody else. So. The women of the wall wish to do all this. We are facing a lot, we faced a lot of violence from the locals. We went to What does violence mean or not? Violence means that we take, took women to hospital, that women were hit by chairs or by rocks or by dirty, uh, uh, with uh, 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 diapers filled with feces, by, and, and, and the, the sidurim thrown on the floor, and we were called names. And if you want to see it all live, you can watch the movie Praying in Her Own Voice, which is a documentary about the women of the wall, and you can see it. I find it hard to even sit when people watching it because the violence is, is awful. And what is the possible justification for what you've just described? We are, How does the other side justify this? We, are, we thought for many years that we are injuring the feelings of others, that we are challenging them in ways that are not allowing them to focus and concentrate on prayer. But uh, in the court, when the, uh, and that's why we, uh, we, in our petition, we ask for 11 hours a year. And we're saying, give us one hour a month on the new day of the new moon, the day of Rosh Chodesh, which is happening this Sunday at seven in the morning, the new month of Tammuz. Give us one hour, and you, the government, decide when is the hour that is least injury to the people, to other people. Five in the morning, 4.55 in the morning, you name it. We'll want, we want one hour for all Jewish women to have the first bat mitzvah at the wall or to have their first per one hour a month. 11 hours a year, Rosh Hashanah, we're off. So it's, we went with that to the court. Our American sister said, what do you mean 11 hours? You deserve 24 hours, seven days a week, you know, Americans. <laughs> and we said, no, one hour a month is plenty. 
when this came to the court, the Minister of Religious Affairs came to court and said, 11 hours is too much. Because I believe the wall listens. I believe the wall sees. And as minister, I know what the wall wants to see, and I know what the wall wants to hear. And it doesn't want to hear these women, and it doesn't want to see these women. Guys, this was said by whom? The Minister of Religious Affairs, Eli Suisa, at the, uh, in 2000 at the Supreme Court of Israel. And the judges, who are mostly secular, and see the wall only when it appears on television. And when it's on television, it's probably a holiday, so there are thousands, thousands, thousands of people. They don't know that on a regular day. It's not. There are more cats there than people on a regular day, especially early in the morning. So uh, this is when they came up with the idea of an alternate wall, another wall for us, Robinson's Arch. Um, we are challenging the women at the women's section because they are asking the most subversive question of all. They're asking themselves, why not? Why is this group doing that? And Mark, we are not just reform and conservative. We have a very strong faction of orthodox women in our group. As far as I know, we're the only group in the world that prays together from all denominations. I don't know of any men groups that does it. Absolutely no. And we have been doing it for 22 years. We are a kehila. We are a community. And we are made of orthodox, reform, conservative together. All women. So, um, um, We've been coming to the wall for 22 years, and right now the situation is worse than it was. First, because of this new regulation, I was arrested last year for breaking the, that regulation and holding a Torah scroll. If you want to see my arrest, it's on YouTube. Correct. If you look up, and you see that it's uh, not, a, it's, it wasn't done pleasantly uh, by the police, and uh, I was interrogated, and when I have to leave Israel, I need to show that I have a round ticket so because I'm not fleeing justice. Oh, and you knew you would be arrested? Yes. Yes. <laughs> this was a form of formal civil disobedience. I didn't know that. Yes, I... you did. Yes, you did. <laughs> OK. Um, I will try to argue if it does get to court, if they do charge me. Right now, they're not charging it because there's a lot of international pressure not to charge. But there's a lot of internal pressure, yes, to charge. And thank you for having international pressure. That's very important. Um, I'm going to try to argue, and I agree it is weak. Uh, but it is an argument mm -hmm. that holding a Torah scroll unopened mm -hmm. in the middle of a service mm -hmm. is not a religious act. Huh. It might fly. <laughs> it might fly. Hello, hello. It's insane. Why should I be arguing this? This is the holiest place of for the course, Jewish people. I'm half the Jewish people. True, I am a minority. Not every girl wants a bat mitzvah, but that's what we're fighting for. We would like to have the first bat mitzvah. There were 20,000 on the other side of the partition in 2010. I want that special girl who wants to have that bat mitzvah. It doesn't have to be a girl. It could be you. If you want to have a bat mitzvah as an adult, I want you to have the opportunity and I'm willing to bend over backwards and do it one hour a month. You'll have to come to Israel on that one hour. But I think a timeshare makes sense. Not a space share, but a timeshare. Um, so we, I like it that one subversive act supports another. I love it that they, the talitot are supporting us all over the world. And uh, this is where we're at right now. We're fighting for this. Uh, you asked me if it's, a, I wanted to explain why it's like the Dalai Lama. Yes, but I need you to sit down again, so we need to get it. Right now, things are not as good as they were 22 years ago. There's a regulation against us. There's an arrest against us. Um, 
there is another wall that was invested to give to send us away. These are not good situations. But in 50 years, there's no doubt in my mind, there will be a bat mitzvah at the wall. Israel will be leading the Jewish world in innovation in Jewish. We have to do it, otherwise we will perish Jewishly. And they'll be standing on our shoulders. It's not a marathon, it's like a relay race more. So I am hoping that one of you here will decide that she's buying a talit, or she's coming to Israel next time on Rosh Chodesh, or she's showing up at seven o'clock this Sunday at the Western Wall to join us. Most people feel that it's the height of their trip to Israel was to join us. And you're just one to a few days away. Mm -hmm. uh, and thank you for asking. <laughs> Probably the overwhelming number of people who are watching right now on Shalom TV, as is true of people in this room, are wholly sympathetic to everything you've said. There are also Jews watching right now who think you're wrong. And if they were here, this is what they would say to you. Within the Orthodox world, it is in some way uh, both upsetting, if not from a certain perspective, halakhically impermissible for a woman to do what you're suggesting should be done by women at the wall. And that what you need to understand is there are places for women to go. The where ladies' room? No, where the kahila, the congregation, has a different view of Jewish practice. They wouldn't say halacha, Jewish practice. Where women are free to wear a talit, a kippah, yarmulke. They're even permitted to be called to the Torah and recite the brachot. But there are also places in the Jewish world where that would be a violation of their own integrity. What, and it's not about whether they're right or wrong. Their perspective in, the, in a Jewish pluralistic world is that their understanding of halacha would make what you're doing halachically, legally impermissible from their perspective. And that then you're imposing upon them something which violates their own standards and their own belief. And that it's one thing for this to be done within some kind of private a roof, but that what you want to do is bring this to the general public forum at the most public Jewish spot in the world, which at the moment the State of Israel has designated to be under the control of the Orthodox, not only the Orthodox, the Rabbanut, which represents ultra Orthodoxy. And that what you're doing is, therefore, not only violating from their perspective, halacha, you're also in some way failing to respect the minhag of a community Good in point. the state of Israel. Good point. And that as a, you know, as a loving, caring person who cares about all persons' civil rights, in this case, their civil rights for the Jew, why wouldn't Anat Hoffman understand that even though there is something wonderful from her perspective, El Chalit, at the wall you should leave it alone? You know, I worked on this project for 22 years, and now I see the light. And I'm going <laughs> to stop harassing at the wall. And you'll say because of Mark I'm not Gallup. coming on Sunday. <laughs> Mark has talked me out of it. What a compelling <laughs> argument. That's it. We're calling it off. We're closing the amuta. No, no, We're I don't done want to be with this. <laughs> but you understand what I'm saying. How, wh what would you say to a, to a Jew who, in a, in a very respectful and loving way, tried to explain to you why they respect you, but it's the wrong forum, it's the wrong place to do this? Uh, you know, it's always the wrong place for women. It's always the wrong time. There are other, th other things. Look, it was a mistake to give it to the rabbis. Yeah. Had the rabbis been people of vision, such as Rav Kook, who was a, would never have been elected today to be chief rabbi, uh, Rav Kook, Because he's too liberal. Much too liberal, uh, that he would have found uh, room for women at the wall. There wouldn't have been a problem. But uh, giving it to these rabbis who became drunk with their own power and very pressured by the most extremists of their own camp was a mistake. My problem is not with the rabbis who think that this is, uh, that this is wrong. 
they should believe it and la brut. My problem is with the secular state of Israel, mm -hmm. with the secular police, the secular court, the secular Knesset. They're all, they, the secular Knesset passes a regulation that I am punishable by one year imprisonment for holding a Torah. That is the problem. With them, I have a problem. And with the Jewish world. The Jewish world is too silent about this. We need to make sure that the only wall we have, and it is the only the only one, you know, Besheva Singer came to the wall, this is, and his, his son says to him, no pops, what do you think? He said, eh, like any other veiling vault. <laughs> <laughs> it's the only one, what can we do? It's the only one we'll have to share. It's probably one of those tests that we have. How can we share in this space? And my suggestion, and it's a 22 year old suggestion, let's share in time. Share in time. We do it with our kids all the time. Stop arguing. He's going to have it between two and three, <laughs> and you're going to have it between three and four. That's what we do with the one computer. That's what we do with the one television station. That's not, so that's what we have to do here. And if we don't learn to do that, this is going to continue to fester and grow. And it's not just the women of the wall who suffer. I have an, a complaint now from a nun who was asked to take off her crucifix, just walking by there because that too is a religious act that offends the feelings of others. I have a complaint of a person on a wheelchair that came on a Shabbat on a, a battery operated uh, wheelchair and, it, and uh, on Shabbat you shouldn't be using electricity, they told him to turn it off. So all the, he came all the way from Gilo, had to go back all the way from Gilo, he couldn't approach the wall. And endless territorial behaviors to tourists. Don't wear your bag this way. Don't hold the, don't talk on the phone. Don't uh, hold the Jerusalem Post. <laughs> All sorts of behaviors that show this is not yours. This is mine. I'm a better Jew than you. I, this, is, this is my territory. Orthodoxy misbehaves. Alt a absolute power breeds corruption. They are corrupt. And, they, they, and I, you know what? If, we had abs if the reform movement had absolute power the way they do, we would probably be as corrupt. There isn't, it's, it's that. What they need is a kick in the pants, is an excellent competition. We need the wall has to be run as a national monument, as you said very well before, national monument, open to all. And who's gonna run it? All of us will run it. A representation of the Jew diaspora Jews, an archaeologist, people from the municipality, women of the wall, and of course an Orthodox rabbi, and he can say whatever he wants, and we will be re-elected every once in a while by different institutions, and it should be run the way, the way it is said in our scriptures, ki beiti, beit filai my house will be a place of prayer for all, all. We are measured by how we deal with the most extreme, the Minister of Religious Affairs sat with me and said, you know, you reform. If a million of you came to Israel, then we'll talk. I said, if a million of us came to Israel, you won't be Minister of Religious Affairs. Eric Yaffe will be the Minister of Religious Affairs. The whole point is how we deal with a minority. Mm -hmm. How do we deal with a minority that has great majority abroad? So I would say to the non-Jews watching, first, you've got your own warts on your own. Uh, I know that the Catholic um, nuns are not able to give communion, except for Mother Teresa. She was getting away with it. But all the other nuns are not allowed to give communion. Only men can do it. I know that in the, uh, when people go to Mecca for the, for the, for the Kaaba, Hajj. the Hajj, women, there are things that women can't do and things that, all the daughters of Abraham, Christians, Muslims, and Jews, we're all suffering from a patriarchy religion. For men who had no daughters, man, there's so many regulations about what the daughters can and can't do. And all the daughters of Abraham are awakening. This is the final frontier. How do they say in Star Trek? Where no man has gone before. And religion is where, this is where the revolution is now going. And I see some Muslim women, uh, some Muslim women, some Christian women, who, are, who understand what I'm talking about when I say we should be sitting anywhere in the bus, we should be able to pray at the wall, I'm willing to, take, to understand that this hurts some people, so I'm willing to do it, but not even a minute at the wall? Never? Not at all. So you didn't convince me. <laughs> Why can't, it's okay I didn't convince you. <laughs> I'm not sure you really addressed the issue. No? Why can't there be a third section of the wall? Excellent idea. I'd go for it. Me too. It's much more a, a drastic than what I'm offering. I I'm offering something that doesn't change the architecture of the place. 
But uh, you are saying something, but I, fine, okay, let's we do agree. that. We agree. Third part, that means men, women, pluralism. Exactly right. Uh, great. And that way the authors could do it in a way I'm willing even to do the following. Robinson's Arch, that they spend all these millions, yes. let's make that the pluralistic wall. And then a person walks into the door, into the holy place of the Jewish people. If he turns to the left, he's going to the ultra-Orthodox shul, where he's asked to breathe in a, with permission of the rabbis. But if he goes to the right, he's going to the pluralistic area where men, women, Jews, non-Jews can do anything they wish except spit and piss and Wouldn't that be beg. Wouldn't that be wonderful? <laughs> Wouldn't that be wonderful? Yes. So we Let's do agree. Do we do agree. Yeah, that's, agree. That's wonderful. Let's do that. Speak about one more issue for me. We've now done the men-women issue. How do you feel the state of Israel is doing in human rights, both in relationship to Arab Israelis and in relationship to Palestinians on the West Bank? Well, with Israeli Arabs, I think uh, one of the, um, it, it should worry all of us, left, leftists and right-wing alike. Because if you are worried what will happen to the teeny weeny state of Israel if the Arabs from outside will attack it, what would happen if 21% of our own population, a fifth of Israelis, will turn against the state? That would be terrible. We are so blessed that Israeli Arabs, on the whole, are loyal to the state, and they very, very few of them became terrorists. And it, we are lucky because we are giving them we don't give them the time of day. On every account we look at, they are discriminated against, and that is a terrible shame. First, because they're a wonderful human resource, and we should use them. I think they're a wasted resource, because if I were negotiating with the Palestinians across the border, I would take Israeli Arabs with me. Who else is a witness that Jews can make it in this neighborhood? Who else can speak Arabic? Who else can speak Arabic and culture and and negotiate for us. We take generals by the dozens. We don't take any women, but we don't take an Israeli Arab. Why? Why? It, look at how well we did in the last 63 years. Let's make a little change and bring some Israeli Arabs to the table that will negotiate with their brethren about the final solution with the Palestinians. That's a great idea. Altogether, I would like the Palestinian Israeli uh, Arabs to feel more in touch with, more in tune with the state. It's very important for our safety, and it's very important for us as a, as a Jewish state to do right by our own minority. So uh, when I see rabbis who are racist, and they, I think the police is now investigating 39 rabbis that we have complained against, and one of them was arrested, maybe you should know, it's us that's behind the mm -hmm. arrest. <laughs> Um, they are civil servants and they shouldn't be racist. Freedom of speech does not apply here. You cannot be racist and get your government's salary. Mm -hmm. You want to be a racist, do it on your own time and your own money and, uh, and see if you have a congregation. But if you are on state salary, you can't be a racist. So much of the corruption of orthodoxy in Israel is because there's so much government funding behind them. Why don't they have it in their Orthodox communities in New York? Why are they that, not that corrupt? Because he doesn't call the governor of New York when the roof is leaking in the shul. <laughs> and he doesn't call the governor of New York if the Torah needs repair. And he's not calling the transportation of New York to say that the underground should be segregated. There is now a poster of El Al, and it, said, it shows men lifting boxes at B&H. It's a uh, store in New York yes. where the, you, you buy camera equipment. And it says, if you want to see them work, $1,500 round trip to New York. For Israelis, if we want to see ultra-Orthodox men work, go to New York. $1,500, you can see them. <laughs> we don't see them work. They are all on government stipends. And you will say, enough. Where but in the Jewish state should people study in yeshiva? Sure, you're right. Some of them should. 62,000? All of them are geniuses? 2,000. 3,000. I'm willing to pay their stipends. They should be excellent yeshiva students. But you know how many marvelous minds are buried in the yeshiva? People who would like to study science and English and history and civics and life skills, they don't learn that. They are, you, you should meet an adult yeshiva student. You'll be amazed how unemployable he is. He doesn't know anything. He knows a lot about Shas, Poskim. He doesn't know Nevi'im. 
He is expert in one thing. And you know what many of them want? To read a book, to go to a library, to see a movie. They're, some of them are very anxious to break out. There's a whole government system to help people become ultra-Orthodox. If you want, want tomorrow to become ultra-Orthodox, government will pay for all the uh, kitchenware for you to change everything to become kosher. Mm -hmm. But if you want to go out of that world and you want to go to university and do your matriculation and study, there is no such system for you. That's where we come in. We work on that. That's a different story. So I don't think Orthodoxy is corrupt by essence. Mm -hmm. I think that we corrupted it by making it a, a part of the government. I think you are lucky that you have the divine document of constitution. Your fathers were parents, were geniuses, were terrific. I think it's a divine, holy document, the only one in democracy still working after 235 years. How old are you? That's wonderful. You should be very, very proud. I studied in America, and I learned about the weekend, which is wonderful. <laughs> Baskin and Robbins. Do you still have it? Yes. Yeah. It's not so good. No, just the idea of so many flavors it boggles the mind. And, um, and I learned about your constitution, and I'm terribly jealous. I would be unemployed completely in Israel if we had a constitution. Everything I deal with is constitutional law. Mm -hmm. And the thing at the wall, it would be un blatantly unconstitutional. So I want to thank you all for being such a wonderful group. You don't need to put it in the program, but just this wonderful. They are wonderful. Guys, yeah, they, this is the are. end leg of your trip and you're awake? <laughs> <laughs> well, well, I don't want anybody to misunderstand you. Yeah. You are not saying that, they're, that you are intrinsically against an Orthodox world or an Orthodox community having a right to express its own form of Jewishness? We just won a case for an Orthodox guy who wasn't accepted to a high-tech company because he observes Shabbat. We are representing Orthodox women in the segregation buses. They are all Orthodox. The case is called Reagan versus the State of Israel. Nomi Reagan is an Orthodox author. We changed the law in the Knesset regarding rabbinic, uh, the rabbinic courts and changes in law representing 24 Orthodox organizations. Mm -hmm. For crying out loud, I spent all last night with the Orthodox women and women of the wall talking about one little thing in our Sidhu. You won't <laughs> believe it. And in the middle, one of them had to walk the dog. I didn't say, <laughs> trust me, I'm up to my ears in Orthodox women right. and Orthodoxy. Of course, I'm a pluralist. I believe Israel should have Shemitah. We should every seven years spend 28 million shekel, where else in the world should we have this ridiculous thing? But no, we should have it here. I'm, I'm a true pluralist. But the tragedy is that the word pluralism in Hebrew is pluralism. We don't have a word for it in Hebrew. The word for integrity is only four years old. I wrote the Academy of Words. We need a word for integrity. Say integrity, yoshra. Yoshra. It's four years old. It's almost brand new. Now I wrote, them letter, yes, I wrote them a letter. Yeshua. I wrote them a letter that we need a word for accountability. They write back, use it in a sentence. <laughs> <laughs> okay. I, here comes accountability in Hebrew. It's nine months old. It's hard to say. You spit. You can't help it. You shouldn't say it often. Here comes accountability. Achrayutiyut. <laughs> Achrayutiyut. <laughs> Now I wrote them. I need a word for pluralism. But guys, we're 63 years old. Integrity is four years old. Accountability is nine months old. He doesn't know. He, first time he heard the word achrayutiyut. Yes, yes, David. David, did you hear the word accountability in Hebrew? Achrayutiyut. Now he knows. OK. And now pluralism. We're looking for a word for pluralism. It's still at large. Guys, we need help here. Israel is way too important to be left to Israelis. <laughs> Does anybody have anything they would like to ask or not before we close? Anybody have any questions? Take the microphone and then pass it back to me. Is your organization working on the issue of two Jews who are not Orthodox being able to be married within Israel and have a reform or conservative rabbi? A non-Orthodox rabbi. A non-Orthodox rabbi. Yes, absolutely. We published a book called 50 Ways to Wed Your Lover, which is uh, sold out. And uh, this is 50 ways in which one can marry by proxy, meaning using uh, a consulate of another country, such as El Salvador, 
<laughs> or go, of course, to Cyprus and get married there, which you are, you're asking about staying here. All these marriages will have to get a divorce here in rabbinic court. You understand? In the end, the problem is rabbinic court. We want people to be able to have freedom of choice in marriage and then freedom of choice in divorce. That is that if you got married in a civil marriage, you will get divorced in a civil divorce. That is not where we are. But here is our strategy. We're going to have a big campaign. It's now on internet, it's the Israeli internet. It's showing different celebrities trying to fit into a frame of a picture. And they don't fit in. To the tune of Hava Nagila, you see them trying to fit in. And it says, we don't all fit into the rabbinic frame. And we are going to place in the end of July, and you will hear about it in our newsletter, uh, the sick, for the 16th time, the law for freedom of choice in marriage. We know it's going to fail, but we will make every member, secular member of Knesset who voted against it very famous. We want to start using our nuisance value, just like the Orthodox are using theirs. We want to make members of Knesset pay. So we're, we're bringing the 16th one knowing it will fail because we have the 17th one in mind. I think it's going to pass someday. I understood that the Supreme Court's, uh, I think I understood that the Supreme Court's decision on the buses to desegregate male from female or ma female from male, what against that, was based on the use of public funds, that it's a public. Are public fu if public funds are used to support the Western Wall in any way, then I don't understand their decision. If it's a religious institution and not supported by public funds, then it seems to me different rules may apply. Alex Schindler, the president of the uh, URJ at the time, wanted to bring all the reformed Jews to Israel to celebrate the, the victory of the 67 war. And our government almost fell because it turned out that he was going to bring 2,000 reformed Jews to the wall plaza and pray together as a mixed group. And uh, Levi Eshkol, who was then the prime minister, decided that the running of the wall will be in the hands of rabbis who understand the most the religious needs of the Jewish people. That's where the mistake began. You are right that right there then we should have challenged the partition. Now that the partition has become reality, uh, I looked at this issue. Uh, th that boat, legally, that boat is pretty much missed. But what? it's a fantastic question. It shows, are you in law? And such a bright. sharp mind, wow. Mm -hmm. To what extent, by the way, is the whole problem the result of the fact that Israel always needs a coalition government? and the small ultra-Orthodox parties are necessary for a coalition to have the 61 plus seats needed. And if Israel ever changed its electoral political system so that the Orthodox parties, which do not represent a major stream, but are only, what, maybe 10% of the Israeli people. And you said it earlier, most Israelis are not pro-Orthodox, they just don't care. But the system gives ultra-Orthodox groups a great disproportionate power in the state of Israel. Do you see any hope of the political system changing and the problem being fixed in that way? Uh, in order to change the political system, the existing members of Knesset have to approve a changing in the political system. And they have a vested interest in not changing one little iota in what's happening in the political system till the changes, uh, chances are very low. But the ultra-Orthodox are an obedient bunch and they beat us at the democratic game. They come, the dead come to vote, everybody shows up. And we need to uh, mobilize more. And, uh, and the numbers of Israelis voting is growing lower. You know, first of all, I get to meet many, many wonderful people doing the work I do. And I told you as we started, I've been looking forward to meeting you for a long time. Sometimes when you look forward to meeting someone, they disappoint you. You did the contrary. Thank you. You are an extraordinary Thank woman, you. extraordinary Thank human you. being. Thank Impressive you. Impressive in heart, mind, humor. Toda. 
and you are leading a very important fight in Thank the state of Israel, and you're leading it for us. <laughs> I love you very much. I, can't help I hope I hope many people get to meet you through Shalom TV, Thank and that they then that. come to meet you in person. Thank By the way, much, I love you. Seriously. Is this is this for sale? For yes. Sale? Yes. Okay. It's for sale. And by the way, I want to offer this through Shalom TV as well. We'll talk about Do that. that. Take okay. it. Take Ladies it. Ladies and gentlemen, Good. I'm not Hoffman. Thank you. Thank you for your time. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. You're out of this world. Out of this world. We would be pleased to send a complimentary DVD of this program to anyone who wishes to support Shalom TV with a tax-deductible gift of $36, double high or more, to the nonprofit organization Jewish Education in Media. Simply visit the Shalom TV website homepage and click on the Donate button to make a donation by PayPal or your credit card. And please indicate the program for which you would like a DVD. Or you can send your tax-deductible check made out to GEM, to Jem, Post Office Box 180, Riverdale Station, Bronx, New York, 10471. And again, please remember to indicate which program you would like to receive on DVD with our compliments. And we thank you for your kind support.